do a whole lot of inputs anymore. Um, and I'm, I think it's kind of cool to have more, as many people as possible impart that knowledge. We aren't locked into a whole thing dumping synthetic fertilizers on the rest of our lives as farmers. So that's David Longy here for those of you who don't know. He's an amazing <laughs> gardener, farmer. Um, you'll find him on Facebook and he'll give you lots of information about all the amazing plants that he grows. Anyone else? The best farmers, uh, agroforesters in Hawaii, the Hawaiians, have been doing it for 2,000 years. Uh, but the current state of being is that the government um, incarcerates us and throws us in jail. That's why we're not standing up there. Mm -hmm. Really, if you want to learn about agroforestry, the only way to learn it, the best way in Hawaii, is from Hawaiians. Mahalo. Actually, Dave, you know, one thing too that you just pointed out there is really true because, um, like, where I farm in Hakalao, you know, this is prime territory for farming, but it's really. Um, become the, a haven for, you know, wealthy people, um, a lot of people who aren't from Hawaii, and that includes me. But I do feel like a lot of Hawaii's sons and daughters are getting locked out of um, being able to pursue farming because of this land speculation. I heard it called gentrification, like gentrification, but, you know, there's more to it here. Yeah, well, I mean, it's just one factor in being able to do this. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, just a little, uh, just a little bit about where I'm coming from. I grew up in the forest of, of the Garden State in New Jersey. Most people don't realize there's forest, but there's actually a, a highest density, or population density of black bears in the lower 48 states. Um, and that was my backyard, so I got to, you know, with this little quarter acre spot where we lived, so I had an acre, but then I could walk for miles. Three miles in one direction and not cross the road. And that was just some timberbearing spot. I got a little thing here. Um, is that. You guys need to make a little Yeah, feedback, yeah. Yeah, feedback's kind of. I'm just going to pop out. Okay, how's that? I like that better. I'll, I'll project my voice further. So yes, I grew up wandering the woods, and, and uh, it was really an amazing thing that I didn't really understand the value of it until I got older. Um, I went to college, and after college, I just realized I didn't want to do what I went to school for. You know, big waste of time. But luckily, it wasn't back at, or wasn't now when it cost a lot of money. I didn't have the experience to know what I wanted to do. So I found out about this thing. Can anyone tell me what these species have in common? Endemic. Endemic, I heard that. Endemic? Endangered, yes. Endemic and endangered. So these creatures in this plant are in danger of going extinct. And the one on the bottom is actually extinct in the wild. It is no longer there because of uh, the loss of habitat due to creatures crawling and eating and stepping on everything. And so when I found out about that, I decided that I had to do something. And I looked into farming because farming was such a problem. I realized that the farming, with it being a problem, I want to find some solutions. So I apprenticed on an organic farm in Washington State where it was a practical education, so learning by doing. I don't have a formal education in agriculture. So, you know, just so you guys know, it's, you know, no professor or anything like that. That was 20 years ago. Uh, this is my 20th growing season now. Or, 20, yeah, 20th. So, with that said, you know, this is usually how I talk, start my talks, but I have something else I have to add to this now. And that's really unfortunate. I wish I had good news for you. Actually, I'm sorry, I do have great news for you. I have amazing news that, that actually, a lot of this just came this week, um, and I'll get into it in a little bit, but it's really, we got this issue. Climate change is the biggest issue humanity has ever faced. Has anybody heard the, the latest news, like in the last like, six months, of, of like, what, the, what they're saying that we need to do in order to avoid a major catastrophe? <coughs> You got one person, yeah? Yeah, they're basically saying that unless we 
totally overhaul our world economy that our whole planet is not going to be able to support our life within like 20, 30 years. Major. Major. And, it's like, and it's not just like they're saying it, it's like 90 climate scientists, like listen, whatever number you want to put on it, are all signing on with the UN. And it's the UN is basically saying, like, listen, if we don't do this now, it's like We're running out of options. We're running out of time. And I, for me, one thing I like to say is, is that as humans, um, it's very overwhelming to think that we can destroy this earth. Exactly. This earth will live on beyond us, but it's us destroying our home that we're actively doing. And um, to think that we can destroy this place is a really egotistical view. That's the truth. So let me, uh, let me jump into this here. This is the data. The UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change it came out, uh, the, I think it's the sixth report came out, came out in October of 2018. And they said by 2100, coral reefs would decline by 70 to 90 percent uh, by, uh, if the global warming reached 1.5 degrees Celsius above um, pre industrial levels. We're at one degree Celsius right now, so that's only half a degree more. That's 70 to 90 percent of the, the, the coral is a pile. 99 plus percent if we hit two degrees Celsius. In order to do that, we need to, to reach that 1.5 degree uh, Celsius mark, we need to reduce net carbon emissions by 50 percent um, by 2030. So that's what, like 11 years from now. We've got to reduce all of our emissions by 50 percent globally. And I'll just make a quick note. Most of the emissions are coming from certain locations. They're not coming from everywhere evenly around the world. So this is not like the entire world's making. Relatively speaking, it's a smaller percentage that's actually been causing the problem. And so that's where the solution lies, right? And then lastly, uh, we, by 2050, there needs to be 100% net reduction. Uh, so no more carbon emissions. We are already seeing the effects of climate change. Now I'm sure somebody was thinking this, right? No, we'll never, never be able to stop using oil. Well, that right there, I have uh, our friend Trinity here to keep an eye on things for us. Well, you know what, we don't have a choice because if we want to survive on this planet, this is what we have to do. Maybe this is why they're looking into going into Mars because they've been feeling that it's just not going to work. But I'll tell you what, their money is better off being invested into here than trying to go find some other rock somewhere else to colonize. So as we are right now, we have rising heat waves, intense rainfall, and sea level. Uh, 1.5 degrees, uh, we have our 70-90% decline. The Paris Accord, you might have heard about that. Uh, there's two, three countries that are not in it. America. The United States. Syria, which is in a civil war, and Nicaragua. Nicaragua did not take part because it did not go far enough for them. So they were hoping to hit two, and then they pulled it back to 1.5 when they started realizing how bad it would be if we hit two. At three degrees, we lose large areas. It's too hot to work. You cannot do anything outside. It's already like that in, in a number of places in the world. The ones with the money and the resources We'll still be able to drive around. It's just the regular people who are going to struggle the most. Four degrees, Greenland and Antarctica melt. 230 foot sea level rise. Think about Hawaii. How many people live at the 230 level? And even if we hit these numbers, even if we reach the numbers we're supposed to, like they're saying we've got to do this, it's still going to melt. It's just not going to melt as quick. And below that, that uh, ice, there's uh, the permafrost, which I'll get into in a little bit. It's called the methane bomb. <coughs> Basically, there's double the amount of carbon underneath the ice as what's been put into the atmosphere by us. So it's like, it's like somebody else is running the engine now. We can turn ours off, and somebody else is running theirs. Then lastly, six degrees change. Marine photosynthesis is threatened. 
And, you know, most of us are, you know, we're walking on land, we're not spending much time. Oh, I can't say about you, know, I'm a farmer, I'm not like big on the ocean, I go, you know, soak in there, but um, who can tell me why does that matter? Oxygen. Oxygen, <laughs> that's right. That is the lungs of our planet, right there. They say the Amazon is, yes, but the algae in the ocean is huge. If that algae is done, guess who else is done? We're at a point now where we've already lost, what, about 50% of the coral. So I'm not sure what their numbers are saying, if it's, it'll be another 50, you know, another 50%, or if that's the remaining, they'll be 70 to 90%. I have no idea. I'm not, I'm not dealing with those numbers. I have the, the big picture, and I'm working on the solutions. And so I'm just going to show you some stuff. We're going to look at what the, the, the numbers say, and then we'll get into the solutions. So as you can see, coral is dying. The bleaching events are happening because the water is getting warmer. As the coral dies back after the bleaching events, invasive algaes get in there and make it so that the coral cannot grow and do its own photosynthesis. They were these pictures in Hawaii? Um, you know, some of them were, and then I was just kind of like rushing to get some stock, so not all of them are. That last one's some of them. It is. Okay, good. So yes, the ocean, basically the ocean's been taking cracks. It's been getting, it's been the, the world's dump for the longest time, and now we have this greenhouse gas, carbon, which, you know, it sounds like carbon, right? Like, what the heck is carbon? That's like leaf litter. That's like, no big deal. Well, it turns out that the ocean's been sucking up this carbon. There's this relationship where that's the thing that's been warming. That's what's been taken up. So for all this carbon that's been released, the, the ocean has taken most of it. And as a result, we've seen, and, and I read about this 20 years ago, that the fish stocks were going to be collapsing, the corals were going to be dying. All these things have come true already. We saw major fish stocks collapse, like over and over in the past five years. Uh, theoretically, we are buffered by a huge ocean. I'm talking about the islands. Yeah. And logically, we're not supposed to be affected by the global warming at all. That is a fallacy. <coughs> but anyway, I'm just throwing that in the hopper. Okay. Just for yeah. minds to think that yeah. even though we are in a very buffered situation, we have a huge ocean isolating us from the land masses of the earth, why in the heck, I should use the word, why in the hell? Are we suffering from the world? Right. Well, it's all connected, right? And, and that's if you if you watch the videos showing how the carbon moves around the, the environment, it takes about a, like part of a year to get to the lower part of the, the you know to the south pole, basically. So we are buffered by distance, but you know think about the air. The air doesn't know boundaries. The air moves as it wants to. So, yes, the ocean is suffering. We've seen a lot of losses. So for those who survive on the ocean, it's already, there's already been an island lost, a native culture lost their, their traditional island off of Georgia, covered. So that means you know, more refugees are going to happen, more losses. So it, it's not good. And I'm here to say that the matrix threatens nearly all life on this planet. And like Eric said, something, you know, we're not going to kill the planet, something's going to survive. Something will come out of the primordial soup, hopefully, that will turn into, you know, some so-called higher life forms. But the reality is we don't have much time to, to make this difference, where we can stop this. We don't have much time, and we need everybody's help to do this. So, I have to, I have to change clothes here. I, I, I have a, another role that I'm playing here, which... Stop President Trump. <laughs> <laughs> That's a <laughs> problem. <laughs> so it, it's, by, by all means, it's, it's, you know, whatever it's going to take for us to reach that goal, and you know, being mindful about how we're doing it. Um, so, yes, the Matrix is real. I was sent here to tell you about it. <laughs> you think I'm joking? My code name is Thunder. I've been in the underground for 20 years. 
there's other people in this room who are in the under, underground as well, but they've chosen to remain anonymous. Now, the reason why I'm coming out like this today is because we're losing options, but we're also gaining options at the same time. So it's a really scary point in our lives, but it's also a very exciting potential that, that we're seeing. Those of us who've been on the front lines for so long, those of us who've been looking for the ways out, we've found solutions. And what we're seeing is amazing. We, I, I, I doubt, uh, hopefully some of you are seeing some of this, but what the possibilities are, what we can do, it's not like using nature, but it's time that we listen to nature and find out what nature needs. And when we know what nature needs, when we understand how nature works, there's unlimited potential. And that's, I'm, I'm just, I can't tell you how excited I am, but yet, Concern. Okay, so let's just. Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm going to back up here. Let me see if that's going to work. All right, okay, so I brought with me a new app. We've been working on this program to help get the word out, and that's why I'm here. We're in a secure room, and the matrix is real. It is very true. We could not do this elsewhere. There's a lot of places on Earth where we would be threatened with death if we're doing what we're doing tonight. But you are all safe, nobody will know you're here. But we have this app that allows you to see what I'm talking about. So we're gonna look at, for a little bit at the climate change, then we're gonna look at the solution. So if you'll, you'll join me here, check it out. Um, so the app is like, uh, you see how it's got those glasses, right? It's kind of like that, but it's a newer technology where you don't need those glasses. It's going to allow you to see some of the things you're going to see you'll be able to take home with you, others you will not. You're going to be introduced to the team. We've got people around the world working to make this change. Some of the team members, if you decide, will go home with you. And they are going to work. You don't have to do much for them. They're going to help you in our goal of reaching a climate-friendly environment. So what you do, is you put your hands out like this, take a deep breath, all right, close your eyes. Actually, sorry, leave your eyes open because you gotta see this. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, wait, before we do this, before we jump into the matrix here, turn off your phones. Turn them off, because you know what? The matrix does listen through your phone, even if you have it turned off. So you have to pull the battery out. Yeah, you gotta pull the battery out, thank you. I need it for time right now. The Matrix knows <laughs> God. That's it. I'm serious. That is my code name. We've had successes around the world. Multiple campaigns around the world. We've saved old growth uh, forests in Canada and uh, Argentina. We've stopped pollution in Bellingham Bay. Stopped the dumping of mercury by Georgia Pacific GP. And it was through people around the world working together. The reason why we're doing this now, though, is like I said, we, it's, it's on the edge of, we're on the edge of a revolution, a change in thought that can change everything. So now, put your, your Morpheus glasses on. Okay, it's going to take a minute for you to get used to. So we're going to go through the matrix now, and you are going to see a different thing. All right, we don't have much time. Okay, wake up America with all the hysteria, all the fear, all the phony science. You can take off your glasses whenever you want. You don't need them anymore. By the way, those glasses, you don't need them at all anymore. You have them for life, if you want. Uh, all that fear, the phony science, could it be that man-made global warming is the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people? He believes it is. <laughs> He's the current chairman of the U.S. Armed Services Committee. Uh, the chairman of the U.S. Yes, Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works. Wow, two wow. sessions. And he supports a ban on same-sex marriage. Okay, well, that's... He's had some important jobs, so let's see what he's, he has to say. He actually has a book about this. To my knowledge, no one has uttered the term global warming since 2009. 
It's been completely refuted in most areas. Okay, guess what? Okay, it's been refuted. That is great. That's what I came to tell you is actually there is no problem with climate change. You've all been fooled, and the hoax has been on us this whole time. So you can go home now. You can keep on doing what you want. You don't have to worry at all. Okay, that's good. No one left. Okay, good. Since no one left, here's what you're going to know is he accepted over $2 million from oil, gas, and coal companies. And check this out his state, Oklahoma, which never had earthquakes, now is prone to earthquakes due to the fracking that he's been responsible for bringing into his state. So that's the kind of person. He's one of the lead people out there saying how there's all these problems. So the problem is, 97% of scientists say it is a problem. The other 3%, a number of them are going to be paid hacks, you know, basically people who have that, they believe it's false, or they're willing to um, sell out for it. And as a result, we now have the US, what's that, in 2014, saying over a majority is not sure about climate change. And I'm sorry, but I'm Russian. Like I said, we don't have much time, so. So here's some details. Exxon knew about climate change in 1977. But you know what, with, with the matrix, I was able to go back in time and I found this book that was put out in 1970. And in this book, they talk about climate change. They talk about the effect of carbon on the environment. And if this is, you know, Scientific American, who knew Scientific American was a part of the production? So they spent over $30 million on think tanks to promote uh, misinformation. And that's their trick. They denied it for a while, then they, they started sending misinformation out. Fox News, one of the greatest purveyors of misinformation on, on the media right now. Uh, according to PolitiFact, they are lying about 60% of the time. The Daily Caller, which um, Tucker Carlson, he's a... a well, as maybe Donald Trump would say he's, a, he's an upstanding person, but he's a, a racist, misogynist, divisive person who uses his outlet on Fox News and The Daily Caller to sow division and misunderstanding. Turns out he is supported by the Koch brothers, who made the, they, they actually bought Georgia Pacific after we stopped them from polluting. They, and their, their solution to the pollution, the pollution was they just went down to Mexico and set up shop where you know, brown people with no rights would not complain, whereas us white people who were tired of it, you know, that was their, their easy answer. So Koch Brothers, second largest company in the United States, 13th largest uh, air polluter, and top 22 in the climate polluters. They've given over $150 million to climate change denial. So I hope you see the hoax now. So do your homework. Whether you believe in science, uh, 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 climate change, or don't, do your homework on it. Don't just take their word for it. Don't take my word for it. Go find that yourself. And there's tons of information. Just you know, Google the uh, UN IPCC report if you want to read that in, in detail. There's summaries as well. Feel free to take pictures of the screen if you want. Um, I wasn't able to print the, the, the notes of this yet. Oh, sorry, I'm going to back it up again. So, Dr. Chip Fletcher, he is uh, part of UH system. He's a climate scientist and he has awesome videos on YouTube. So, he explains the science very well. Um, makes it very uh, understandable. So here's, here's my response to those saying that climate change is natural. It's because of volcanoes. No, it's not. Climate change is not because of volcanoes, because volcanoes only emit, what is it, about a hundred times less than what humans emit each year. Volcanoes, when they go and explode, they actually cool the environment down, as we saw with Mount Pinatubo. The other issue is, um, what's the other one we hear about? Oh, it's a uh, solar decline. The solar minute, or 
It's, it's, it's getting hotter, right? It's getting hotter naturally because the sun is getting brighter. Well, actually, no, we're just starting to go into the solar minimum. So we're getting less and less solar energy for the next 11 years. And the natural climate history tells us that uh, this is through ice core samples. They go down into the ice, they measure the carbon. And you see here, here's the carbon levels. And the carbon relates to temperature. So the higher the carbon, the warmer it is, the colder the carbon, the, the lower the carbon, the colder it is. It turns out we have this shift called the Milankovitch cycle, where the Earth rotates, and about every 100,000 years we have an ice age. That's my relative. Get out of here! <laughs> I'm serious. Awesome! That's great. <laughs> well, tell him thank you, because uh, and that story is amazing. <coughs> He first predicted like the like the how the cycles of the earth like the yeah. we are talking about like the earth yeah. and it's changing. Yeah, yeah. If you get a chance, look at how he learned about it and where he was and how he got the truth out. It's amazing. So we've been going through these cycles and then lo and behold, this you know, there's the warm period, and then oh we go down, down, down. And then we shout up, and as you see, you don't stay in the, the, the warm period that long. Except we have. It's a strange thing. We have, and what it is, is the original climate change, agricultural clearing, despite all the native species that got killed off and all the, the, the bad things, it warmed up the environment, which allowed uh, agriculture to continue. When the native people died off uh, due to the plague, and when um, or the plagues, but also the Black Plague hit Europe, there's major decreases in carbon, and they had the Little Ice Age. So there's a couple little blips on there, it's related to mass people dying, and then those people not burning. That's what caused it to go down. So we do have the ability to change the environment, but now we're overshooting what would have been good. We're going to be shooting up <coughs> off the charts. See ice age, interglacial, <coughs> greenhouse gases have skyrocketed since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Hold on one second, I gotta I have to turn my phone off, make sure it doesn't ring. Um, yes, so I think we all know industrial operations are what's causing this, right? been the fuel for this engine that's sped around the world. Not only that, but it, it's been what has allowed them in the last 40 years to wipe out a huge amount of wildlife. Massive amounts of extinctions. Here in Hawaii, we are the global capital for endangered species. And so we've been having one small country after another. It's the U.S., but it's not just the U.S. Large countries are swallowing up the small countries. They offer them loans to help them out of debt. They say, peanuts. oh, here, we're going to help you develop. Peanuts, What's basically. That? Peanuts. Peanuts, yeah, but with interest. That they'll never be able to pay, <coughs> and then they're indebted, and then they lose their land, like what happened in, in Mexico. They were pushed out by corn. The U.S. had subsidized corn. They dumped it on Mexico. Dumped it on Mexico. The, the, the Mexican farmers, the originators of corn, could not farm corn anymore. What do they do? They move into the city to work in the sweatshops, the new sweatshops that opened up. They lost their land. Sweatshops stayed open for 10 years. They shut down and went to Malaysia. Where did all those Mexicans go? The issue we're seeing today is very related to the U.S. policy as it relates. And I believe, this is my personal <coughs> opinion, it's intentional. Causing that disruption creates people getting off their land and they move in and take it. So here's uh, some of the things you need to know about in terms of agriculture and just why the weather is strange. There's a vortex up around, let's see if I have, yeah, it's up around the, uh, the, the polar area. Cold air stays in there. As we're having the, the jet streams change and slow down, the vortex is breaking up. 
And that's why we get the polar vortex that comes down occasionally. That's the reason why it was cold recently. Remember how it was like, like a month ago or so? It was like really cold. Um, if you follow news from the, the US, you'll know that they had the polar vortex and all kinds of issues. And what happens when this polar vortex happens, there it is right there. Let's watch this, it'll show. So you see it's going, but it dips down occasionally. Here, it just dipped down. Here comes another dip. There's the dip right there, you see that? And so the cold air, full of moisture because it snow's evaporating, right? Is going down to really warm places, so it'll shoot down. And when you have hot and cold, what happens? Storms. Storms. You get stronger winds. So the greater the difference, the greater the storm. And that's why we're seeing stronger storms. That's why we're seeing snowballs when you shouldn't see snowballs. Hopefully, we're you know we're, we're going to be good here. Um, I actually flew. And it's like, you know I'm, I'm just as much of a part of the problem, even though I'm part of the underground. It's I've been using the matrix to overcome it. And, you know, it's, it's a slippery slope. I, uh, I was flying in, and it was one of the scariest flights I ever had in my life. Where, right as we were coming into Kilo, the winds coming from around the mountain or something, they were going about 50 miles an hour, and I could feel the side of the airplane moving. It was pushing. And, you know, like, you know, I prayed before I got on a plane, um, you're okay. It's also caused these freak lightning storms in California. So now he knows why there's snow. And he can take that back to his buddies in the Senate and tell them why they need to get on board with us. Because climate change is here. 18 of the 19 hottest years of record have been in the last 20 years. The oceans are 30% more acidic than before the Industrial Revolution, and more acidic than the last 800,000 years. For any species that's been alive that entire time, these are all new uncharted waters, new conditions. And that change in acidity, you know, for us it doesn't sound like a big deal, but it's huge. There's creatures who are not able to make their shells anymore. It's not dissolving because the ocean's acidic. The ocean's getting more acidic. It's, it's alkaline still, but they're having their calcium blocked by all the extra carbon. And there's more dis disasters. The Arctic, Arctic is four times warmer uh, than 1900. Or sorry, it's warmed four times the world average. So warming much faster. But uh, is it is just a cycle that's happening over the years? Or uh, according to the, the Lankovich cycle, no. I mean, we should be going into a cold snap. But, and, and I'm no expert. My, my thing is I, it's to bring it to the ground. We had all in the, the couple of like the cold ages. Yeah. It's happening. Yeah, it, it does change. It's true. So I can't answer it. Yeah. And, yeah I, I just don't know. But I do know that they're, they're warning Americans, look out. Two-thirds of the population in the United States is at risk of flooding right now. Two-thirds. That's not a small amount. Houston had three 500-year floods three years in a row. So it's kind of tough to argue that climate change is not here. Drought is a major issue. I gave a, a presentation on the global food was the global food crisis. And it was about the drought that was happening in California. And we got lucky. Because most of our food comes in, right? But we got lucky because, yeah? I was actually in the fair truck and I was like, man, can you say this year? It sucked. There. Like, it felt like, like you're really walking in my yeah. Like, it, like, that, for then, like, it was 2013. I used to wear a jacket every day, eight bucks. Since like 2014, came later on, I pretty much had to pretty much wear a pair of white clothes, and I still have it. Thank you. So, yeah, so much of the food is produced there. Plus, there's all the wildfires. So the wildfire size is, what, uh, just about doubled uh, the number of acres in the last 
what, since 1985. And the way to be wildfire ready, because wildfires do happen, a friend of mine in La Pohon, Illinois, a very wet location, they had to evacuate. There was a fire that came down, the guinea grass, even though it was still green, um, the guinea grass caught on fire, it was a windy day, and it blew right towards their place. And that happens in La Pohon, we all have to be concerned about fire. Have a ditch bag. And what that is, is just, and this is for emergency planning. Have a bag that has all your essentials. You know, a change of clothes, water, toothbrush. You know, some people say important documents, but that's what they tell people in California, you know, in fire prone areas. Just have something where you can grab and go. Or even have it in your truck. So your food, most of it's coming from California. And when it's not coming from California, for those of you know, we try to, I'm sure a lot of us here try to eat from the island. It's coming from other countries where they're still using um, herbicides and pesticides that were banned in the U.S., but still produced in the U.S. So, like, you know, the large chemical companies, they want to keep producing those, but they need their, their people to buy it. But we end up eating it. My slides got messed up a little bit. So yeah, 2011, 2014. And, you know, there really wasn't a lot of, you know, we're so busy, not a lot of people pay attention to the news anymore. But there's you know, major things that, that are affecting us. Less power there as well. Food. So this is where I'm getting to, is, is food. Where is it, how does it affect us now and, and, and in the future? And does anybody eat food here? Does anyone eat food? <laughs> no, is there anyone who doesn't? Uh, there's, there's always one person. Okay. So yeah, we're all in the same boat. And this is why I say like, we're all in the same boat, no matter how wealthy you are or how poor you are. We all eat. Global wheat provides about 20% of human protein. The increasing CO2 will reduce the production um, what, by about 15%. And our population is supposed to grow by 60% by 2015. Is that, no, sorry, 2050. So we're going to see a decline in production, increase in population. Well, that's not good. Uh, they're saying that this could kill 500,000 uh, people worldwide in 2050. And food prices are projected to double by 2030. Which, for us, I mean, if it doubles for us, my goodness, it's, it's already so expensive as it is. Especially if you try to eat healthy foods, oh my goodness, it's so, so expensive. So, we, we got some problems, but wait, there's more. And this is what I was bringing up before, is the endangered species. You know, what does that, what do those have in common? Yeah, that will do this, and this. Anyone have any ideas about what they have in common? There's so many comments. Pollinators. Pollinators. Why, why do bees are this cleaning? That's, that's why I brought some honey today, just to speak for the bees. Um, the, those, those species in the beginning, they're endangered. Uh, the, the Bay bug is in, at risk of development up on Mount Achaia uh, due to that, the TMT telescope and all the other telescopes. I mean, think about it. Can they just pick up and move to another neighborhood when they, they live on a mountain top out in the middle of an ocean? No. And that's just it. This battle, this war has been going on, and, and I'm very serious about this, about the Matrix and being real, and the underground. But this is part of the good news that we have now, is we're just realizing we thought we were alone fighting the struggle. No. There's so many other species out there who've been fighting the struggle, struggle for way longer than us. And they're glad that we're on board now. And unfortunately, Ohia, beautiful Ohia, right? It's, it's been struggling. There's been one pest after another brought to these islands. Yeah. This place, this was the toughest place for me to grow food. When I got to Hawaii, I grew in Vermont, I grew in Washington State where we could get six feet of snow. Why was it tough for me to grow food here? Because of all the pests and weeds and plant diseases. So, and also depleted soil. And now we've got this. I think many of you here know about rapid Ohia death. And so that's why I ask you, what has happened to the air, 
the land, the water, the fish, the insects, the birds, the wildlife, people and cultures of this earth. At this time when we are losing so much, we reach this point where we're really at a make or break situation, where if we don't do what we need to do, it's not only going to be over for all the species that are already on the edge, like Ohia. Ohia, if, if Ohia is, is threatened, think about all the other species, because Ohia is not just a pioneer species that pops up, pops up right after a clearing, not just a climax species who's there at the end, it's a keystone species. Keystone species have interactions with many other species. They're like an umbrella, and like all the other species come and get shelter there, there's all these relationships. And you start pulling the pieces away that they all, you know, all those things and how they're related, it's going to start to fall apart. And that's what we're seeing right now. And, and this is not a new story, actually. This is a very old story. This is the Garden of Eden. This is where this method of this, the matrix, the matrix came from here. The matrix is, is um, a corrupted Oh, for, how many people here have seen The Matrix? Has anyone, I'm sure. For those of you who haven't seen The Matrix, I'm sorry. I hope you might. <laughs> but that's good. We're making headway. we got more people seeing our movie. Um, so what happened there was the code got corrupted. And how it got corrupted was that people there, <coughs> they live in an arid environment. And, and ironically, when I came to Hawaii, I'm going to back up. When I came to Hawaii, I went to... Uh, Pookala Ikaika Dombigas's workshop, um, and he said, Know who you are. If you're going to be in Hawaii, you better know who you are. And so I started looking into who I am, my name, and, and my family, and all that. And I can, on both sides, go back to that place. And it, it's, you know, it kind of sucks. I'm like, wow, that, that was my ancestors who started that ball rolling. But basically, they left where they were looking for something else because they, they saw the matrix and they were looking for something else. They brought the matrix with them. Basically, they're an infected host. They didn't know it. And what they did was they killed the predators. They killed the things that ate their animals. So they killed the wolves. They killed like, the, the jaguars. And so after they killed them off, they thought, this is great. Our cows can go everywhere now. Our sheep can go everywhere. We don't have to worry. And it was great for a while. Until, um, they, they, you know, they, of course, they were cutting down the trees because they need to build. And then the farmers below started noticing, hey, wait a second. We're doing our flood irrigation, but there's less water. Is anyone else noticing that? There's less water. And what happens in a dry environment, when you do flood irrigation, you're bringing mineral salts up because it's the, you know, the rain hits the mountains, comes down. As it goes and runs across the land, there's salts in the water. You put that salty water over the same spot and let it dry over and over, the salts build up. Unless you have enough water where you can flush it out. So they reached this point where they could no longer flush the salts out. And that is the reason why the Garden of Eden is now Iraq, as we know it. They kill all the predators already. There's no more predators. There's, no, there's some in the mountains. There, there's still there some. There are some, like, but like, there are like between Israelis and Iraq, right there. Like, see, like the Iran. In Iran, there's some. Yeah, they're, they're in the mountains. But, you know, just a handful left. So that was the thing, though. That's, that's what started that, that ball rolling. And that is the, the root of our problem here, is we've been thinking that we can do whatever we want to nature. We have the choice, like God. We think we're God. I mean, that's, that's my assessment. People think they're gods in nature, and they can do whatever they want without having an impact. It doesn't matter. Well, I say, ask not what nature can do for you. Ask what, nature can, what you can do for nature. Life is beautiful. Protect it. I actually love this picture. I'm not sure where it's from, but because usually I, as a plant person, I like getting pictures of plants. I see people all the time, but I was like, you know what? Wait a second. These are endangered species. <coughs> There's an endangered species too. That is us. 
That is why I'm saying we have to act. Because if we don't do it, they're all done. And when they're all done, guess who else is done? Maybe our descendants can survive on cockroaches and rats. But is that what we want to leave them? And luckily, here we go, we're going to get into the good stuff. Um, the world is looking to Hawaii. Master Cho, uh, the, the originator of green natural farming, he said that at an event one time. And it was during the, uh, the ban, the GMO ban that we were working on. And there's a number of reasons. One is just here in Hawaii, it's many cultures together interacting, but also it's the revitalization of Hawaiian culture, where colonialism came, you know, overthrew the country, has occupied it, and displaced the people, which still continues. But the Hawaiian people have stood, and around the world, others have stood, and they're embracing their cultures once again. So no longer is it shame to be your culture. No longer do you have to hide in fear something that your ancestors worked so hard to give to you. We also have an amazing number of people who are brought here and people from here who know so much about plants. And I know many of you, I see many of you here, so many committed people, and it's, I'm just thankful to be here with you. This is, they say East meets West in Hawaii, but really it's East and West meet Hawaii. And what we have coming out now is really exciting. Climate-friendly agriculture is just another term. It's just another term for what's been done so many times before. And it's the truth. Hawaiians are the ones. And I'm going to get into it in a little bit for Hawaii. That is the model to learn from and embrace. But the conditions have changed. So I'm going to offer you some, some tools that you can use. So the goals are increase our production, adapt and build resilience, uh, reduce greenhouse gases, and I actually added this last one on there, it was not even on this list, is sequester and convert the greenhouse gases, rather than just let them float around. I've been asking, well, what can we do? This whole time I've been saying, well, what can we do? What is the answer? I fought them, I fought them, I have a criminal track record, I have conspiracy charges in two states. And after all that, I finally was like, well, I fight and fight and fight and they pop up somewhere else. I need to work on a solution because if we're busy fighting them the whole time, what are we going to replace it with? Are we going to be some revolution that you know, rises up and overthrows their masters and then turns right into the same problem that they tried to get off their back? No, you cannot do that. Exactly. <laughs> That's the best part. We're not going to overthrow the matrix. We're going to overgrow the matrix. Yeah. So we start with adaptation, right here at, at the front lines, on the ocean. Holly Oloha, Lohoia. I spoke with uh, Luca Kanakaole, he hosted a, a high school group that I was there with. And it's real. They're seeing more damage on the walls. Uh, they're seeing higher high tides and higher king tides, you know, the, the really high tide that comes like once a month or once a year. And know that's all it takes. Just like erosion, all it takes is one night of rain, right? It just it can happen like that. The damage, just, you'll see a little bit. You know, there's the, the trickle that happens. That's erosion too, but the stuff that the mass erosion, it's all it takes. So they are innovating and adapting. They're raising their walls, building layers into the walls. That way, when a wave comes. You know, one of those big waves, it doesn't just push the whole wall through. The front will peel off, and then hopefully the rest of it's going to hold on through the storm, and then they have to rebuild. Um, and then also they have to move their ponds back So that is why Haleolono is a, uh, it's an endangered cultural site, because they're backed up against a road. What can they do? There's private fish ponds behind them. They can only go so far. So that is one of those examples right here, right in Kilka. Then another example of adaptation is uh, Kalopo Lohoia. Uh, Ruth Aloha, she wasn't able to make it here tonight. She organizes a group that helps to clean it up, remove the weeds intended. And when I was there, 
uh, we were noticing lots of jellyfish. The students were getting stung, and we had some conversations, and uh, my, my buddy Kiahi was there too, and, and out of those conversations, one of the solutions sprung up. Got my, my box of tricks here. This is, this is called um, JAA, <laughs> Jellyfish Amino Acid. It's a variant of Korean natural farming's fish amino acids. Nice. So you take the, you know, the fish, you add brown sugar, and then you let it ferment, and then it, it pulls the nutrients out throughout osmotic pressure. So the problem, the jellyfish, turned into the solution. Literally, this is a sol solution, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey Dave, yes. we're, we're doing a, a point thing for the mongoose. The mongoose, wow, really? <laughs> so, yeah, because you can also throw mongoose and soldier fly bins. Yeah, that's right. People drown them and then do that. So, that's, so another lesson is, is, you know, this is a pretty basic one, but if you, if you wage war with water, you're going to lose. So what they're saying is, if you're in a coastal area, you're going to have to get up. It's in, the water is actually coming out from the ground as a water table comes up with the ocean. During storms, you'll see the water ponding and pooling. Like I saw it in Kyoto, Makahiki, two years ago, where it was drenched everywhere. There's just the water was just coming out of the ground, and then let the water go through where it makes sense to let it go through. You, you cannot stop the ocean forever. You don't want to be the Dutch boy sticking your finger in the dam <coughs> trying to stop it. Okay, so I have. It's pretty classic. I have way too much information, not enough time. So I'm going to just pick and choose some of these things because I really want to get to the end part, which is I broke it down into a system. And this is, this is what I'm going to call an app. And that's why I'm here. I've been working on this app. It's, it's an old, a version of the old code that I've been given, but it's put together in my own unique way. And, and I'm here to share it with you. And then after you get to experience it, you get to go try it. You're not going to be able to just run with it. This isn't the matrix where you're going to go and be able to kick someone's butt because I said you could. But I'm not going to teach you how to kick butt. I'm going to teach you how to overgrow the system. So number one is working together. That is the biggest thing. That is when humans come together. Like when we have a storm, when there's some disaster, it doesn't matter what your politics are, what you look like, who you are, you know, it doesn't matter anymore. We're all the same. So the, the, the communities that are already strong now are going to be the ones that are going to do well. The ones, if you know, in this American system, we, we're a bunch of individuals living in our pods, right? Little batteries for the matrix to run off of. It's tough to survive when the matrix shuts down and you're one of those batteries. So we have community hubs, as we saw in Pune, that is an awesome way to go. Put in strategic locations where it can be where everyone brings the resources, and I'll be straight up, fuel is one of our resources that we need right now, right? So if the fuel is there, then the food is there, the medicine is there, the babysitting is there. Once you have your hub, things get a lot easier. School gardens are, are amazing on the island. We have so many school gardens. We're actually a leader in getting school gardens going. Home gardens, many places garden here. Wild gardens, I take avocado pits and just chuck them everywhere I go. It's my favorite kind of garden. It's just, ah. I'm done. I, I worked so hard. I planted a tree that'll get 30 feet and load tons of fruit, and it took about half a second. Uh, don't clear in the winter. Makahiki, and, and also don't clear in heavy rain. Pretty, you know, pretty basic stuff, but, you know, sometimes it doesn't always work that way. Including for myself, I, I hate to say it, I, you know, it's, this is also for me. Um, so yes, erosion control measures, so there's that black fabric. You know, more plastic, more of the matrix. Some of these tools are going to give you are parts of the matrix, but it'll at least reduce the destruction. So that, that weed mat they have, they also have an erosion mat. So if you're clearing on hillsides, like, and this is, what, the tallest mountain on earth, right? Um, so we're all kind of on a hill. You can use a barrier 
And the weed mat barrier or the erosion barrier is a way to basically trap the sediments before it runs into the ocean. There's all kinds of natural things you can do as well, but that's just a cheap fix to, to protect a bunch of land quickly. Do you want, could you talk to me about barrier grass? I will. A little bit? And yep. I don't know if anybody's seen the picture online, but there was this Reed's Island picture where like one property owner didn't have bed of beer, and then their neighbor had a bed of beer, and then this whole thing just went. Yep. And the people with bed of beer, they're, they're close, they're, they're close. Strong roots. They're very, very resistant to erosion. Uh, it does wonders. So, low capital projects. That's what's going to be, you're not going to lose your shirt. As I, I, I do these consultations, and it's kind of a frustrating job because usually people who are hiring me because they have a problem. And they want me to go help them with some thing. Um, yeah, it's, and what it is, is they bit off more than they can chew. They have a huge project that they started. They don't have the experience. And they have the, the money that they want to throw at them. Tell you what, how many people from Hawaii have seen this happen? And, and, and how many times have they crashed and burned? Me, I spent <laughs> millions of dollars yeah. on this item. I you, just show me a million dollars, tell me what you're going to do. Awesome. So, uh, so yeah, reduce the project size. That way there's less damage and then really you can do a better job rather than trying to squeeze as much as you can out of you know, a whole bunch of land. You can hold more than what you can squeeze out of. So start small and do a great job and you get much higher production than trying to get a whole bunch out of a huge area because that turns into a major drain that will ultimately destroy, well, destroy the land, definitely. Uh, biomedicine is so important here. We have diabetes, heart disease, and cancer are major issues. They're epidemics. 50% of the people in Hawaii are either diabetic or pre-diabetic. That's a lot. But yet, we don't hear much about that in the news, you know, or not much about solutions. You know, we're just supposed to go and get some insulin, I guess. Why is that? Um, I, think it, I think it's, you know, there's a reason. But, but there's solutions, like, so mamaki for, and koko lao for diabetes, they, they help reduce blood sugar. Exercise helps reduce blood sugar. Sour sop. This one is our lovely sour sop here today. Yes, yes. Came all the way in. And I'm bringing these things out because these things are in the boat with us. They're at risk as well. And they work. I'd like to say 24-7, they kind of do. They don't work as much at night time, but they're still working. And they need your help, but not tons. Especially when they're babies, they need some help. But this thing is amazing. Uh, the leaves and the fruit are effective against certain types of cancer. Uh, and, and for pretty much everything I'm talking about, there's scientific studies to back it up. I try to give the studies when I can. So yes, soursop, cayenne for heart disease, chili pepper water every day. Wound treatment. During storms, that is an issue here. So many people live off the grid, don't have like clean water. If you don't have clean water and you get injured, and our land is, this, this island is just, I feel like it's a wash in pathogens. Staff is all over the place. You go to the ocean and come out dirty nowadays. So we need natural solutions, and they're there. For, there's, a, there's actually a plant for every illness use for every plant. So we need to work on the wound treatment one because during emergencies when they don't have oil, it's cholera, which is a waterborne illness, and injuries. People getting injured with a machete, they get stabbed, they lose an arm. This happened in Bougainville uh, off of Papua New Guinea when they, they claimed their, their independence. They suffered, I think it was about a 10 year uh, or no, a seven year siege of the island. So they had to survive off the island and they lost about 20,000 people. And wound care was one of the biggest things. All right. So extreme rainfall, be ready for it. 
here's what happens. You get the heavy rain for days, right? The ground gets saturated. And then what happens is the, the low spots are filling. Now we have overland sheet flow. Has anybody seen this? When it's after raining for days and you get the really big storm after, like after one storm you get the other. And the water is coming up out of the ground and moving across like a sheet. Everywhere you see there's water moving down the hill. Has anybody seen that? Yeah. So when it's a storm, put your trash bag poncho on, go outside during the worst weather, as long as it's not windy, and you'll see it. And when you see that, that's when we have so much erosion that we can actually turn into a solution. Uh, the channel areas get carved, then we have extreme flooding, mudslides, and landslides. And I'm just going to mention these solutions because I'm going to show you the images, and that's part of this thing. This is like the download that you're getting. So traps, things that slow it down. Um, like I said, erosion control, sustainable slopes. So when you're making a clearing, don't just, you know, if you're on a hillside like this, you want to make a path, most people just cut right into it and throw the dirt on the downhill side. And now on the uphill side, it's a cut back. Right? Can you imagine that? It's a just cut out. It's called an unsustainable slope. If you do that, Gravity is always going to be taking this stuff down. <coughs> your ground covers are going to wash away. Your seeds are going to wash away. Your mulch will wash away. Nothing will stay there except for weeds and erosion. So make this slope sustainable, which is taking from the high spot, going over, and then bringing it down so that you're actually lowering it above and raising it below. You know, the, the global warming is something that we are going to live with. Now uh, that means our crops that we are used to grow now in Hawaii cannot be uh, the climate that is becoming prevalent now is not suitable for them. So our institutions, have they addressed the issue by activating their procedures or whatever funding to look for new varieties or Things of that nature? Um, I, could, I couldn't say. I'm not able to, to say on that. I know the state of Hawaii is, is, they're working to get carbon neutral. I'm not sure where they are with that. And they're also looking to double food production, which I'm not sure where the food's going to go. So <laughs> we, we in, uh, import about 90% of our food, export 80%. And this is from Tim Richards, the, the Kohala, he was a, what, a Kohala um, County Councilman. He said the island export 80% of the food that is grown here. So if we're going to double our food production, but just get stamped with grown in Hawaii, it's got magic in it and shipped off for, for top dollar, we're still going to be in the same situation. It was, we would sell it in Europe like crazy. <laughs> I'm telling you, anything comes from Hawaii. Probably would go. Because, so that's the, the, the culture, they're cashing in on the cultural appropriation, but what people don't realize is that Hawaii's land has been poisoned. Right? What I see now, like, I'm like, oh, growing in Hawaii, I'm like, I need it, but it's tough. Okay, so wind. Wind is something that we're going to see more and more of. How many people have, uh, do you, how many people got damage on their place? you know, farm or house, wherever you live in the last year, any kind of wind or water damage? On your infrastructure? Okay, okay, we're doing all right. Well, we had two canopies get destroyed this, this fall and winter. One was from a rainstorm, where we usually would take the, the tarp off and on. Um, so the tarp got destroyed, it pulled the whole metal thing down. And then the corner winds carried the other one away. Um, so what we can do for winds are, number one is don't cut the trees down. Wind breaks um, are very important. You see them all over the place here. Internal wind breaks, to slow the wind down internally within your plantings also make a big difference. I'll, I'll, I have a slide in here about like, how to design it, uh, and it's with permeability. You don't want to have a, a wall. You want to. Go through slowly. I use vinegar for that too. Oh, 
So you can use vetiver not only to contain erosion and slow down the sheet going down your hill, but it also works for wind, for areas <coughs> of wind in gardens. So we cross plant the vetiver yeah. within or across the particular to the slope wow. to contain the erosion and then plant behind it. Thank you. That's so good. Really good. I just had a question for you, Dave. You mentioned this, uh, is it Tim Richardson? Yeah. Tim the Richardson. I just, that comment you made about 80% that we export, I mean, first of all, uh, he might have been referring to cattle production, where we produce 60,000 head of cattle on this island and export 99%. And then also the big growth here is GMO papaya which would be exported as well. I don't think, you know, I think, in other words, if we actually brought real food, food crops up, right. and we would be consuming them on island, it's just that the food crops that he's referencing are all the exports. Yeah, the, the commodities back Yeah, it's a good point, it's a good point. Um, so uh, root crops are a big deal. Root crops are something that, you, you know, the flowers on your trees might blow up, your trees might blow down, but your root crops, They'll still be in the ground as long as you don't have erosion. The leaves might be shredded, but the, the root crops will stay there. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll just bring this one up. Well, I'll, I'll actually bring up two. Let's see. Does anybody here raise pigs? All right. You're the. I saw you have pigs, huh? Here you go. This is for you. I'm going to throw it to you. Ready? My arm's messed up, sorry. Good catch. Oh. <laughs> All right, so that one there is called Canna edulis. And Canna edulis is a, an amazing plant. It's almost like a cross between uh, taro and olema, uh, turmeric. It grows similarly, and that's like a wooly. It's, I mean, check it out. It's like, let me see what you're doing. <laughs> that looks, yeah, I think that's it. That is it. Yes, that's it. So, you can cut the bottom off and you can grow it like a wooly, but the, the cool part is it's actually nutritionally similar to corn for pigs. Corn is used as a, a fattener, right? So this thing is like, like basically perennial corn. You plant it once, and it actually runs slowly around. It can grow in part shade. It can grow in wet ditches. So you can grow this in, in a system where the animals harvest the food. Well, I just, I just really want to jump ahead. I think I'm going to just start skipping and then... <laughs> drought, we're going to deal with that. I have some stuff on drought. Shade. All, yeah, I'm just going to, I'm going to skip. Sorry. Just... So yes, we're going to hold more than we can squeeze out of something. And that is letting nature do the work. And that is these teams. That was, that was one of our team members right there. Canna Edulis is one of the team members that's going to be working for us. This thing, is, sorry, I should say working with us. So we need to let the problem be the solution. Right? We've got this problem and solutions. Well, guess what? If the problem becomes a solution, we can fix it really quick. And this is why I'm, I'm really, <laughs> I can't believe how excited I am about it. Of this thing, but it, it's mind blowing. I got a glimpse of it. That's why we have these goggles. I'm gonna, that's why I want to share this with you. So get ready to empower nature to turn the greenhouse gases. That is a resource. Turn that into abundance, right? It's a, you think it's a problem. You know, there's all these charts and all these all this data about how it's so bad. Turns out carbon is has a one like what is it? A global warming potential of one, but it lasts for hundreds to thousands of years. Nothing, another greenhouse gas lasts for 25 years, but it only has, or sorry, lasts for 12 years, global warming potential of 25, nitrous oxide, 300 pretty much. That's how much it wants up in the and 1.14. So methane is mainly from uh, enteric vegetation, or, or sorry, enteric um, fermentation. Cows, guts. Cows eating corn especially, which we have to find out if this is going to do the same thing or not, but um, it, they release more methane. And then nitrous oxide. And breathable permafrost melting. And yes, the permafrost.
permafrost melting. That's why, we, and actually, the, I'm just going to jump to that right now. So I think we might have a solution to that. So there's microbes. Microbes are, are, are all around us. I'm covered in them right now. If I were to give you a hug, I would inoculate you, okay? And then likewise, you would inoculate me. And it turns out that microbes are such a powerful force in nature that has been untapped up until recently. And, and we're just starting to see it. And, and the breakthrough is, it's called biogeochemistry. Can you say that? Biogeochemistry? Bio <laughs> say bio! bio. <laughs> um, so the thing is, is that there's the carbon cycle which moves the environment. So it moves carbon through the environment. The methane, all these things have cycles. And the microbes are the things, they're the changers. Oil has been made by microbes. It's just microbes that don't have a lot of air and they have time. They turn the carbon, which was old vegetation, they turn it into uh, methane. Um, or what we see as oil, it's been made by microbes. All these things that we have now, by microbes. The, the nitrogen cycle, microbes are the ones that break down the nitrogen and make it for plants, uh, available to the plants. We use synthetic fertilizers now to skip the microbes. They just get the direct feed, we hook them up to this. But it's causing problems without the microbes. So my, my hope is, we can create, we can find, we've already found enough, I'm not going to say we, scientists have found a number of microbes for carbon, nitrogen, uh, nitrous gas, and um, sorry, nitric ox oxide. I'm so excited, my brain's getting all shy here. And then lastly, methane. To actually convert them into, some things will be just, Totally neutral, not bad at all. Other things will just be less bad. And it'll be very similar to what we're doing with the Korean natural farm. It's basically getting microbes, cultivating them, and then giving them an environment where they have food and shelter. And if we could spread that over about, you know, the permafrost, if there's a way to just get them right there at the source, well, there's their feed. The methanotrophic microbes. They're methane-eating microbes. They're the methogenic uh, microbes. They're the ones who make it. So they have a relationship. If we can get the ones that eat it, right there where they're at, they have unlimited food right there. Boom. But, you know, that whole permafrost thing is like really scary. And then I found out about that. I'm like, wait a second. The little bit I know about natural farming is, has really worked well for me. I think we have, we have some solutions. Dave, are you able to isolate that specific strain? Are they working on they, that? They did for nitrogen, and oh, that was the other good thing. Many of these microbes that perform these functions are abundant. They're all over the earth. And so that's why more than ever it's important that we don't spray herbicides all over everywhere and chemicals to kill everything because those microbes are our allies. They are the ones who do the changing for us. They're the ones who do the work for us. And if we don't use them, then we're, we're the ones who've been thrown out of the Garden of Eden having to do all this hard work because we forgot about them. Hey Dave, yeah. I, mean, I, I agree with pretty much what you're saying, but I was just thinking to myself, um, are you talking about some sort of like mass introduction of methane consuming um, <laughs> microbes to these areas that contain permafrost? Is there these are vast areas of the boreal parts of the planet. And what if they're not, you know, what if these microbes are native to those kind of areas? What would be the unintended consequences of their introduction? I mean, you know, I, I, yeah, so I think you can bring that up. And for all those, especially in Hawaii, we're very sensitive to that, right? And yeah, so I'm not just saying go out there and get all these microbes. I'm saying where you're at is where what you need is there. That is an answer I was giving. What you need is there. And the example was I was digging. And I kept on hitting these rocks with the shovel. I was told, what you need is there. And I was like, <laughs> look around, like, put the shovel down, I find a stick. I get down there and start using it like a traditional digging stick. The hole was dug like that. The rocks are out. I looked at the thing, I was like, wow. I was struggling here, 
And what I needed was right there, and it was a traditional tool. And it, just, and it was just, I just had to change my thinking on it. So no, I'm not into uh, introducing things all over the world and creating more problems. It's more about the localization of solutions. And then finding passive systems that will spread them for us. So currents will carry things. So this whole system, this is why I call it the matrix. It's not just agriculture. Sure, we can come up with solutions here. But you know what? Agriculture is our base. Right? That's civilization, right? If you don't have agriculture, you don't have civilization, they say. Well, there's actually many forms of agriculture that they didn't know about, where we've had high societies and still do today, that didn't have the traditional methods, or the modern methods. So industry feeds agriculture, electricity feeds agriculture, and transportation moves it all around. So we can't just say we're going to work on this one, because it's all connected. So that is a whole matrix. If we don't address this whole issue of moving everything around, I don't think we're going to make the changes. I don't think we're going to switch over to lithium-ion batteries made by you know, child slaves in Afghanistan. I don't think that's a solution. I don't think solar, you know, I think solar has potentials. I'm not saying you know, it, it's perfect, though. The, the people who, who mine the materials, and the people who work in the factories, they, they die early because of silicosis. So that's why I'm saying we need to change this model of high input farming into something else. As you see here, this is the nitrous oxide, um, or no, it was ag production. The bottom here, ag soil management. So as farmers, this is what most of us, this is our contribution. And the nitrous oxide is what it is, and what it is is when you throw the nitrogen on the ground, whether it's synthetic, or get ready for this, organic, or nitrogen fixing, but biological nitrogen fixation. It's a kind of a cool bean thing, right? You get like the, the plants to fertilize for you. Turns out they all release nitrous oxide as a part of their cycle. So it's this weird thing, like, wow, if we can't throw nitrogen down to feed the plants, how are we going to survive? That's been the, the green revolution, the so-called green revolution. Well, we're going to let nature do the work for us. So moving right along, I have the sources, uh, and this is all going to be on YouTube, at probably agroforestry design, I have to make a YouTube page. It'll be on my agroforestry design uh, Facebook page. So I know I'm going through quick. I'm just trying to get through to the, the really fun stuff. Um, yeah, you see here, that, that is really just oxide. Lots of it, very potent. Methane, a lot of it is cows. That is a big issue. And you probably heard this, that, you know, eating meat, you know, is very uh, greenhouse gas intensive. <coughs> compare fruits and vegetables and fish, what is that, 21% compared to everything else, which the rest of them, like, I'm not, I, I'm allergic to dairy or lactose intolerant. I know for sure now. So, no thanks. Meat, I do eat meat, but I try not to eat that much. You know, the, the unhealthy food, we should be eating it anyway. So if we go towards a healthier diet, that'll help us, but it's not going to get us to zero. And, let's see, okay, yeah, so, we're out of here. There's, so how do we deal with this? So I'll start with the, the things you can do, the little steps. And, and one is applying nitrogen after you're planting. So don't apply beforehand, and then you know get it all prepared, and then plant. Because for one thing, your plant's roots, if it's an organic form, your plant's roots can't pick it up. You know you have these little plants, it can't handle it. But what happens is you lose so much through volatilization. There's nitrogen goes up in the air. When you apply nitrogen, it goes up into the air, and a good chunk goes down into the water. And most of the bunch you, you just did is wasted. You only get to use a fraction on the plants. So after you plant, let them get established. And then when you fertilize, 
use a lower dosage more frequently. And what that does is you're not overwhelming the plants with nitrogen that they can't handle. They're getting what they need and you have less um, nitrogen going into that. The pre-plant, can't say it, pre-plant cover crops. So what that is is when you clear ground, actually I have a picture of it, I'm not even going to talk about it. Um, I have not seen any studies that show the exact amounts that the synthetic nitrogen versus the organic versus the carbon fixation or nitrogen fixation, like how much of, of the greenhouses they emit. But I would think that a natural form would have lower uh, nitrous oxide. Number one, because it doesn't have as high of a, like, you know, the NPK, the value. The lower the value, the lower the nitrous oxide being released. Plus, synthetic nitrogen is made through the Haber-Bosch process, where they take natural gas and they heat up ammonia to, and extract the nitrogen out of the air. Um, okay, who knows how much of our air is made up of nitrogen? 20%? Who said that? Wait, what is it? 70. 70? A little higher? Let's go 62. Right? Everyone, everyone on the bed would. No, no. Okay, so my understanding is it's about 78%. So most of the air is nitrogen. That's nitrogen gas. Um, when we do our, our biological nitrogen fixation, microbes gather that nitrogen and make it available. Um, I think that's going to be more efficient and less polluting than bringing in natural gas, shipping that in, going and getting ammonia, and then burning off all those fossil fuels, which are you know, releasing carbon and nitrous oxide and that thing, to get our nitrous oxide. So I think, if it just makes sense to me, it's going to be less polluting to do it the natural way, but I have nothing to confirm that. Biostimulants are a very exciting thing. Uh, this, this is a biofertilizer, but Korean Natural Farming also has things that they call like the fermented plant juices. Um, I'll just be straight up about it. The people who have really done the most homework, it's the people who get paid the most in the farming world. It's an underground economy called Pakololo, cannabis people. If you look in their books, they have a lot of information about all these different biostimulants at different phases to promote growth, to promote flowering, to promote fruiting. And it's not nitrogen based. And it, some of it's like, uh, like you know, um, I mean, even pruning, honestly, you can, when you prune something, the plant releases hormones to cause new growth. So it's, it's getting a more balanced and detailed look about what the plant gets. Plants get sugar, right? underneath the ground, but they also get more, which I'll get into. Um, yeah, and, and I'm giving like key words. I can't get into a lot of detail because I'm trying to give you this big picture of this world that exists. And this world, there's places where the matrix has never made it yet. Never been there yet. But there's a struggle, there's a battle going on to keep them out. And some of the lessons will be shared. So key line design, I'll talk about that. That's going, anything you can do to reduce your nitrogen levels will make a difference in terms of what you're adding. Key line design is going to bring the nutrients to you. Okay, so denitrogen bacteria, here we go. They convert nitrous oxide to harmless nitrogen gas. I think, and, and water too, here we go. Oh, wait, that's, uh, and then there's, Anamox found globally <coughs> to convert N2O, nitrous oxide, to um, what is it? N2, nitrogen gas, water, and nitrate. Nitrate, I think, was that? That's the one that just goes down to the ground, right? It's like it leaches into the, the water. So microbes are doing this. 
And you see this one here, the, the steam nitrogen bacteria found in most, if not all, soils and sediments. So that's what I'm saying. What we need is already there. These microbes are there. That's what breaks down the that. If you throw like manure down, that's what takes the manure and makes it plant available. And then lastly, this is this is super cool. So the enzymes from across different groups of microbes have the power to transform nitrous oxide into nitrogen, nitrous gas. So these enzymes, enzymes, you know, we have like the microbes, but the enzymes are really the part, the parts doing the work. Carbon dioxide. We all hear about it. It's just, you know, fossil fuels, deforestation, vegetation. So the number one thing we can do to reduce the carbon dioxide is obviously not use fossil fuels. Stay local, right? Don't drive, but also support local. Worms. Worms can trap carbon in the soil. So it's a passive system where you add the worms, and then they're going to do the work. And, you know, it's not one worm that's going to save this earth. It's going to be all the worms. It's going to be all the people. It's not one of us that's going to do it. So that, that thing with the Matrix, you know, with Neo, that was put out by the Matrix, by the way. That, that, so Neo, it's not Neo. The truth is you're all Neo. It's not one person. It's going to be everybody. Quick question, Dave. Yeah. Can we turn off that one row of lights? I think we'd make the, seeing the slides a bit easier. I don't know. Yeah, you're right. I have no idea how to do that. Does anyone know where the lights are here? Oh, right behind. Suppressing the weeds. 
you have to kind of change your perspective though. It's not going to be the neat and tidy lawn that people like here. It's going to be rough. It's going to look like a forest. Uh, carbon trap crops. So bamboo. Bamboo is going to be, I think, one of our biggest allies for windbreaks. Because it's a plant of, what, a thousand uses, just like the, the coconut, right? So why not have the meal in these windbreaks? And then obviously forest, right? If that's what the, the, the carbon that we're seeing now up in the air is from the oil, but the oil is just old vegetation. So if it's just vegetation, so we want more vegetation, that's what we have to do now. We need to get more vegetation growing as fast as possible. And to do that, we do intercropping, growing crops together, we fill the space. Biotilling, this is one of the most radical things that I've ever come across. I found it by accident. And then when I started to really get a grip on like, what I was doing, I started doing it more. And then it turns out other people around the world were, were doing this also. So I, I was kind of bummed because I, like, I did this. It turns out someone beat me to the jump. I did, uh, corn, a lot of the corn grown in the US is biotech. Where now they're able to use nature to till the ground. They don't even use the big tractor to till. They use plants. The daikon radish, which, you know, as soon as here, we have our, yes, our, our, our friend here, this, and you're welcome to take these home. I'll, I'll leave the seeds and stuff out here. Um, so when you go take some, just leave some for, for the others. So this is a daikon radish that's bred for its deep root um, and also for, for animal feed. And it's called, uh, this one, it's either Sodbuster, I think is what it's called. At the Kikipikalo Garden, when we planted, we cleared by hand. Kiahi was our Komoiki. He organized the labor, and we cleared by hand, we planted a food forest. It was like basically a Hawaiian food forest or a Kaka food forest. And at planting, we could dig down nine inches before we hit the hard pan. It was a hundred years in cane and in farming, so dozers, heavy machinery, right? That's what we have with our heavy machinery. It's so helpful. I, I love the tractor. I'm like, wow, this tractor's amazing. It's helping my back. But it's hurting the soil. Where the tractor can't reach with its, its implements, all the scraps from above, it's like a sink, and we got the drain here, and as you, you know, the, the drain plugs up with all these little things, right? it starts building up, all the fines fall through when you till, and it falls through and falls through, and basically makes a clay, it's called a hard pan, the roots cannot get through it, and when I go to people's places, and they say, why are my trees dying? And like, you know, there'll be like one branch dying over here, and, and I just know right away, it's your soil. Guaranteed your soil has this hard pan. Even from mowing, push mowing, I've seen it. The air gets pressed out. Biotilling does the opposite. It gets down in there. So within, what was it, I guess it was 16 months, we let the collar go very long, it's organic. So the organic collar, what I've found is it lasts longer in the ground than the synthetic stuff. And this is talking to collar growers. Generally speaking, it's, it, it lasts longer than the ground before it So we go to harvest. When I, I harvest, I look at the soil and I'm like, wow, look at this. This is amazing. Turns out, I, I just kept on digging because it, it kept on, it was so beautiful. It looked like almost like earthworm castings. Perfect soil, a perfect till. Three feet deep. Oh. <laughs> um, Three feet deep is where I hit. So in 16 months, we were able to go three feet with plants. And it was daikon radish, and let's see, has anybody ever had uh, gandouli rice? Anybody had gandouli rice? Yeah, somebody, right? Gandouli rice, some people say, yeah. So our friends at Goya, they're providing this tonight, sponsored by Goya. <laughs> uh, pigeon pea, nitrogen fixing bush, Tap rooted. Um, you can take, grow it by cuttings, but it won't be tap rooted then. So you got to plant it by seed. Um, 
So this thing and this thing, three feet deep, deeper than what a tractor can do. And if you get these and you plant them, they're part of your team. They're going to keep on going. They're going to have kids even, and more kids if you're lucky. And then you have this huge team doing so much work for you to make the land better. And when you make the land better, your production goes up. Because as you get the air down low, the roots can grow. And the more space you have, the more they can forage for nutrients. So you have more nutrient availability. Okay, so biological carbon fixation is just when plants absorb carbon. Right? That's what the whole idea of like carbon fixation or uh, carbon sequestration is. So we want to do that obviously. Oh, time just disappears from this work. Uh, over story, okay, I'm gonna just jump to this. Check it out. There's an enzyme to be put to work in almost any situation, like in a chamber fitted inside a ch factory chimney through which CO2 can pass before being emitted into the atmosphere. And we convert the greenhouse gas into calcium carbonate. Can anybody tell me what calcium carbonate is? Coral. Chalk. Coral. 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 And then, is there anything we use on farms? Lime. Lime, which is called calcium carbonate. So it's an enzyme from a microbe that can actually pull, take the carbon, and turn it into lime. Right? I mean, this is revolutionary. This is huge because that means for us, we don't have a lot of lime here. You know, I don't want to go out and take the coral for the lime. It's a scarce thing, and we have all this acidic soil. So if we're able to have bio industry, which I'm going to just skip over water vapor, the most important one of all the greenhouse gases, water vapor. No one talks about it. It actually doubles the warming potential. But think about it. If we have all this water, what can we do? Is there anything we can do to like trap water? What what holds water? <coughs> Plants. Yes. There's a relationship between carbon and water. Water is drawn to it. Okay. No, okay. So no one should know. So methane here. I'm just gonna jump to the good stuff. Pigs and chickens reduce. They have much less methane than, than cows. So if you go into the Polynesian pig, the kune kune, a very rare pig, it costs like a thousand dollars to buy a sow. Uh, the ones on the island are from Aotearoa, and they look like this, like the ones from uh, the Hobbit or when the, the, the Battle of the Five Armies. That's what it was. The, the dwarves like these. <coughs> they are a grass eater. They're a grazer. So now if you have grass, and you know, grass is pretty tough. You want to keep your grass down when it's dry season, right? You don't want to have a fire, so grazing is good for that sense, but you don't want to have methane. If we as an island switch over to kune kune pigs, Brandon Lee says it's actually a better meat than, than his other pigs that he has. So it's a very quali high quality meat and lower greenhouse gas. The uh, Korean Natural Farming Intensive, what is it, the Inoculated Deep Litter System, that one also has a potential because the poop just disappears, right? It's a no stink, no fly system where the, the animals, like the pigs can stay there for a year and they can keep on pooping and there's no smell and the, the poop disappears magically by microbes. So my guess is that since it's not piling up, that the microbes are converting whatever it is and breaking it down. And that's where I want to encourage people to do science, to find out what exactly is happening, what gases are being released. Is it, it could be worse. Maybe, maybe it's horrible, right? But we need to know what is happening because that model stops water pollution and it can very likely help our air quality. <coughs> a hack that might have some opportunities is they can feed animals, cows, a specific algae, was it algae seaweed basically, seaweed where they had dramatic reductions in methane. So you know, it could be a quick fix, but you know, if we're going to use the matrix to mass produce this one thing to ship around the world, I guarantee you we're going to create more problems. 
So that's why I say, let's go for you know, the kune kune. Bayarat gestures is where you, you, you keep, you store the animals' manure, including humans. And then what comes off is a methane gas that you can cook over. And after you burn it, it turns the methane into carbon dioxide, which is like, you know, 20 times less potent in terms of the warming, but it'll last longer. And why? Okay, so I really wish I had more time. I'm, I'm looking already just like, wow. I, I really didn't get to cover nearly as much as I wanted to. It's already eight, or almost eight. So I'm going to zip through, since we're in Hawaii, if you don't know about Hawaiian culture, you have a responsibility to do so because this is Hawaii. And foreigners coming here with their own ideas and not paying attention, that's caused so many of the problems that we have. Um, and I'm not the guy to talk about Hawaiian culture. I, I can share with you a little bit about what I've learned, but you know, obviously I'm not I'm not come out from Maui, so don't take you know, what I'm saying is like the Bible or anything. So Ahupua'a. Everything contained in one area, from Mount to Makai. This is the original climate-friendly agriculture. <coughs> Look at this, growing on rock. When, the, when you think it's tough conditions, you go down to, to the Kaimu, and they're just growing on rock. And that's what we have in Hawaii. We have so many conditions, and we have so many tough conditions. But Hawaiians figured a way how to make agriculture work in nearly all of them. Within the Ahupua'a, wherever possible, there will be loki above and loki uh, below. So loki for the kalo and then the fish pond below. So the water is clean as it comes through the whole agricultural system. It feeds the fish below. And then here we've got this, these fish here plus the fish in the ocean serving as a nursery. Those, all the young fish in these loki are can then go outside into the ocean. So it's totally underrated what they're able to do. The traditional field systems all around the islands, there's amazing field systems. And this island in particular had a, a number of them. Um, this one up in, in Kohala was a bread basket, the, 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 the Uwala basket actually. That's, this is another one right here. This is probably one of our most important ones for a number of reasons. Uwala, sweet potato, because it grows extremely quick. If there's a disaster, you can plant slips and then you're going to get food. This is one of the earlier ones you're going to get food from. The greens are going to be edible, right? It's easy to grow, it actually smothers the weeds, and you don't have to be a good farmer to, to do sweet potatoes. Right? You just got to keep the weeds out and flip it on itself. Plant loving grass around it. And then it, I've done this. It grows up and then goes towards the lemongrass and then flops back on itself. Because if you don't if you don't do that, it's going to root, right? And when it roots, you're not going to get these roots. But, you know, so if you have rows, I did it in a small trial. If you have rows, it's what I need to do at my next place I'm setting up. Is have them far enough apart so when the vines come out, they run and then flop back on themselves. And then I can just show up and just harvest and barely any work in between. But yeah, so I'm not gonna get into all those. Boiling it down, there's environmental laws here. That's, you know, the kapu system, you know, there's people, different thoughts on it. But luckily we've got our, our glasses on and we can see that the benefit was it protected the land, protected the watersheds. The fishing and gathering seasons were defined. Now it's just take all you want, take as much as you want, put it on Facebook about how big of the fish you can. Um, and also, people fed the fish. They had that relationship. Now it's a little different. But with that method that they had, where they're able to hold nature and take care of it, you can harvest three times more fish than what scientists thought was sustainable. So that's what I've been saying. We can get more if we hold than if we squeeze. Because we can get a whole bunch for a little bit when we squeeze, but then at the end of the day, there's nothing left. 
So a lot of what Yao is kind of like, you know, it's hidden wisdom, Hawaiian proverbs, and anybody here? Hello, Hawaii. Would you say that? Yeah. Hea li'i ka'aina he kawa he kanaka. Would you like to share any insight? Yeah, sure. So hea li'i ka'aina talks about the land being the chief. And he kawa he kanaka. Kawa is a Hawaiian word like, it's translated to mean maybe servant. So the aina, that which sustains us or that which feeds us is our chief and we serve that. We serve that function, we serve that purpose to, to uh, be part of the system that sustains us. So that's kind of what, what that is. <laughs> it's about getting our relationship right. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's, and once we do, it, it's going to be a lot easier. All right, so Kimo Lao, this is, this is something that like, so that is, how do we even talk about this? But at this time, when, when the ocean is hurting so much, who, who, would, who would one of those, who would the king of Lao in the ocean be? Generally, anyone? Anybody else? What's that? Kamo Lao. Yeah. And, you know, the, the author here, which I'm told, is also Kamo Lao. And I, I just have questions about. Kino Lao is amazing because what it is is it's the plant representations or the representations of the gods in the environment. And with our goggles, what we can see that as is as a worldview is it's a representation of, of the forces at work around us. And if we work on that level, I think actually in terms of climate change, we might have some real breakthroughs if we work on it from that aspect. Looking at it from this functional cultural relationship with deep wisdom rather than coming at it from an analytical side looking for studies to lead us somewhere. But I'm, I'm just going to keep it there. I've just been told by several people look into Kino Lao and the little bit that I've learned is incredibly amazing. These are forest gardeners in the Amazon. They're at risk. Uh, they are the ones who actually created the, the forest, you know, the huge forest that we see there. They're, we've been told they're uh, hunter-gatherers. Nope. They left a sophisticated civilization that gave us biochar. They walked away from that civilization. And they live this way now. So they are one of the people who can actually help lead us the, the way we need to go, except for we cannot interact with them. If we were to interact with them, half of the population could die from a cold. And this guy is now the Trump of the tropics. It's, it's really bad. And that's where the rest of the people on the matrix are, are fighting right now, wherever we can, because it's horrible. And globally, what's happening, because I've been following politics, like, like the real politics, not like Republicans and Democrats, and we are in like a really troubled time right now, like never before. And right there, the front lines, where the matrix hasn't reached in that, those parts of the Amazon, they're getting hunted down. Like what happened in California when that land was stolen. They were hunting down there as well. And it didn't end well for the native people. Oh, yeah. So yes, he, he does support um, the military coup. He said to the soul of the woman, I've never raped you because you don't deserve it. And uh, if he saw two men kissing on the street, he beat them up. So yes, Trump gives them two thumbs up. Right before he was elected, he said, we're going to shoot all the PT workers or supporters in, in Easter. So that's the kind of person he is. And, and he just gave Brazil's uh, agriculture ministry the right to demarcate indigenous land. Great. Department of, you know who that is? They're representing Big Ag, the American Big Ag folks who are making money selling us hamburgers. That's what this is for, to give us burgers and make a buck off of it. And that's the, the reality of who that guy that just got elected. Yeah, that is yeah. the guy who we eat the hamburgers for. <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately, from the movie Avatar, that guy is now the CEO. He's in charge of the whole machine. He's no longer just the, the field boss. But what he doesn't know is this guy's here. Anybody ever seen Princess Mononoke? It's the forest spirit who takes different forms. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking at time here, and, and it's 
If it's 8 o'clock, there's, like I said, there's so much more. How, how are we on time? Do we need to just stop now, or, or can we go a little later? Go no longer. Yeah. So I'm going to do this fast forward thing, and, and hopefully it'll work. So those people, somebody hopefully was thinking, yeah, but you know what, those hunter gatherers, that's just a handful, and like, how is the rest of the world going to survive, you know, off of a food forest? Well, guess what? Over on the other side of the world, at the tip of India, there is another culture who is one of the largest, has the largest population densities on Earth. And they did it with forest gardens. They actually have a very high longevity. They have extremely high quality of, quality of living, which they're behind Japan. In 1990, 90% home land. They do it all in 40 bucks a year. And based on food forest, forest gardens. It's the, the, the state of Kerala, India. And what they know about both those cultures is a scale of permanence. Look it up if you get a chance, it's a permaculture thing. The climate takes the most energy to change. And we didn't think we could change the climate. That's why it's at the top of the thing. We, you know, the climate is the most long-term thing. So when we do permaculture design, that's one of the first things we look at. We look at the climate. And the climate is going to determine everything else we do as we go down the steps. So this is something everybody can do. Rather than mowing and pushing all these fossil fuels up, why not turn your lawn into a garden? Like Uncle Henry Leong, he was a master collo grower and he did this. He had these raised beds, this old sheet metal, he had the divider, and he would get the Hilo duck mulch, throw a little bit of fertilizer in there, and he would pull up this amazing collo that he grew to give away. So he would make his coolie at the bottom and make it nice and big so we got lots of whole hot to share. So I have this long list of plants. I'm not even going to cover any of them except for, let's see, I'll talk about one really quick. Maybe. Yeah, you know what? I'll talk about protolarium. So you have probably all seen this flower, but you just maybe didn't know it. It's a yellow flower that you're going to see all over the place on the side of the road. It makes these, it's called rattle pod. And there's a, like 400 species. There's actually one that's a, an edible one. It's the 17th most, most eaten green in the world. Nitrogen fixing plant. The ones we see most of the time on the island are not food for us at all. They have toxic leaves. But this one is a farmer's friend. It's nitrogen fixing and it's a cover crop. It covers the ground. You'll see it in a second. So, within the permaculture design, we start close first. We do a good job. The things that take the most work and energy stay close to the house. The further you go, it should be less work, less maintenance, less inputs, which is like the traditional culture. So you have your kitchen garden, your raised bed, and Uncle Henry have uh, you know, native species, endangered plants. Hollow is an endangered plant because, number one, not that many people are growing it anymore. Number two is the varieties are at risk. We just had, um, my coworker grows hollow and he has an amazing collection and he basically it's twice now you've had an extremely rare call. It's like, like, there's just a handful left in this, this variety. Gone. Pigs got it one time, and another time somebody killed it. Or by accident, they didn't know what it was. So that's why I, I say they're endangered, and that's why you need to have them by your house to keep them safe. This is a food forest at uh, the Kiki Kalo Garden. On the right, this is, uh, or on the left, this is Calpe. Nitrogen fixing bean that was sown after the food forest was planted. So this is Iliwawa. <coughs> Iliwawa, this is probably <coughs> number two in terms of our food security. And this is the one that grows huge, the taro. It's not 
talk to you know Hawaiians who love their kalo and they say, ah, but it's really wow. It's, this is the pig food, right? This is the famine food. And it grows huge, takes barely any inputs. One way to, to plant it, one way I do it is I do that. <laughs> Have fun. Same with cassava. That's, it's, I'm serious. Like when, when I, I just harvested the, the can of edgeless, I took the corns of this and dropped them in there. And, you know, it just wants to grow. And so if we grow those things that want to grow rather than growing the things that we think taste really good, that take a lot of work, and then we'll have to get some success. These are the beans. So it grew, now it's time to harvest these. The pigeon pea is bigger. With intercropping, growing all these things, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've worked with countless species. I don't know how many I've sown exactly. I know I've worked with over a thousand species, including the ones I've killed. I, I, can't know because it's, it's working with them. You, know, you have to know them. I don't kill anything, I don't know. But what I found is you need to plan your access. You need to plan harvesting so that you're not going to be wading through trying to harvest something, like get one here and get over there. That is not the way to production. We want something where we're going down the line, not having to think. And that's what this is, where you can just go whoop, Go down this line, go down the next line. And you notice we got the, the new and the, the mica, multiple stories of vegetation. Permaculture zone three, going further out. Now we have agroforestry. So I like living in the forest. I don't like living next to roads. I don't even like living near houses. Like I don't want to see somebody else's house. So I plant stuff out like bananas. Hope bananas, and then whoop, six months they fill in. Um, thin them out, or else you're gonna have a lot of mosquitoes, right? But um, within the food forest, this is the same repeat. Yeah. So this is that can of edulis right here, and that, that's the patch I went and harvested. So I planted it once, and here it is years later. I'm able to just show up and harvest, even after the pig came through. The pig made it easy for me to harvest. <laughs> And then, so we can do the feed forest where we, we go harvest stuff and bring it to the animals, or the, the forage forest where this is a chicken tractor, you move the animals and let them harvest. You can do electric fencing and run. First you do uh, horses, they knock the grass down. Follow through with goats, let them feed it to a stubble. Then you can have cows if you'd like, or sheep, or you can go to the kune kune. Um, and then you go to pigs, like the rooting kind, to uproot anything, followed by chickens. Chickens are going to go for the seeds, and then ducks go for the slugs. So there's a whole process where you can let nature do what it wants. And this is the thing where you're not forcing it, you're letting it do what it actually does. As long as you're paying attention and not just you know, leaving it in there for too long so that nothing grows. Keepler system, I love it. I just, I think we need to do some more homework on it. There's so much potential for us with this one. All right, here we are. Kuala Farm and Ranch. Yeah, we got, we got some people representing today. Um, if anybody is interested, you, you should check them out. Uh, you're on Facebook, yeah? That's Lockheed in the back, folks. He's, he's the farm manager. He took over uh, from what his cousin created, and it's, it's an abundance. It's a 27-year-old agroforestry farm. And check this out. This is like, when, just when people go there, it's just, ah, it's a different feeling. And this is what I mean about the production. We already have the overstory trees. That's the shade. This tree, the, the, the alba needs some shade. You know, Kane and Kanaloa work together. And, and so here we have the trees growing up high, shading this. And then look at that, the harvest. The harvest is easy. It's not spread out all over the place, wandering to, to get what you need. But yeah, check them out on Facebook and if you want to get involved. It's really, really exciting Hawaiian farm.
Permaculture Zone 4, bees. That's where you have your animals, like silvopasture, and, and silvopasture is um, trees and pasture. Which turns out you can actually increase your production incredibly because you get shelter for the animals. When you take the animals out of the wind, their, their yields go up. You get other crops like coconuts. Um, you get the benefits of the animals fertilizing below the trees and keeping the weeds down. So there's so many more things. And lastly here, uh, the corn-fed cows emit the most methane. So grass-fed cows, if you're raising grass-fed. <coughs> it's better, but it's still, it's not forest, right? Like we have here on this island, we have so many cows here. The Hamakua coast is dried up. Kuhala Mountain is dried up. I drive by so many creeks. And they're dry. Why is that Hamakua Coast? That's like waterfalls and rainbows. Why is Hamakua Coast dry except for when we get a flash flood? <coughs> we need trees. And that's what it comes down to. Permaculture Zone 5. That's where you have your inspirational forest, your sacred forest. And here, this is the people where I live right now in Apulo. And it's this beautiful native forest. I can't let Many people come back there because there is not there. When I got there, there's the, the mild form of rapid old heat death there. And that's the cool, you know, like uh, on the way to Waimea. I'm seeing the, the killer form in Waimea now. I've even seen that time when I was flying in. I was in California visiting family. I went to a botanical garden. I checked out the New Zealand garden there. And there's a tree that, that Ohia is related to. So they say, that's the one, like the distant ancestor. I was shocked when I walked up there and I saw that tree totally dead, just like I see with the rapid oak here now. I walk over down further and I see a stump that was black like we see with the rapid oak here now. So there's a chance, and, and I haven't even had a chance to talk to J.B. Friday about this, because there's a good chance that they have no idea what caused it to die, because that's in California. But it looks like it might have gone to the other species. So that's why we need to have these corridors for the wildlife. Do organic. If you do organic, you can, uh, according to this study, practically double your carbon sequestration. Okay, here's, here's a fun one. This is, this is key line design, except these lines aren't accurate. But if, if you know contours on maps, this is a valley, this is a ridge. And you see how water naturally goes down the steepest spot, right? So if we start our valley, I'm looking here, I'm in the valley, there's a gulch. If I go down the hill on the side at about 2% slope. So I'm going down, I'm walking across the mountainside, going down just a little bit, and going down, 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 going down until I'm on that ridge line, but I'm below up there at 2%. And if you make a ditch and a berm, this is called key line design, also part of permaculture, where you can trap that water, redirect it, which is very much, I mean, to me, it sounds like the whole Hawaiian system, right? Moving water, right? but they gave it another name. But um, you can move that water along the contour line, just a little bit off. You can do it with vegetation. Vetiver grass, if you do vetiver, it needs to be a solid planting, three plants thick, shock apart, feet apart. If you have any holes in that, when you get the water, the water will come, it hits it, it runs along it. Now you have like a river going across the mountainside, and if there's a hole, whoosh, it blasts out and causes erosion. So with all this stuff, this is like not something to play with. I don't do this stuff. I've just learned about it and I've been, you know, observing it. But what we can do is we can take all this erosion and instead of rushing off, we send it over here to this pond. And as it's moving, it gets weatherization. It has, the water is moving the soil and as that happens, it actually liberates nutrients. So the water from those systems is a passive fertilizer. It protects the ocean. And then we send it from one pond over there and send it back and forth. 
and back and forth. And now we've rehydrated it. And now we can send it to the pole by over here. So instead of just having this, now we have options for restoring the uplands. Okay, I'm going to jump through a few more things. Traps are huge. So if you live in a river area, when you get those floods, what you can do is have, I had a, a bamboo trap at a certain point in here. And when it would flood, everything would build up a pile up there. I'd go and get it and carry it into the garden. But luckily for me, after, well, we had one storm, I show up and like, it blew out, and there was nothing there. But my other trap up the bank, because it was such a flood, got it. Um, here, yeah, come here. Come here, this over here, sorry. Yeah, pick and choose. There's uh, vanilla vines. There's all kinds of goodies in here. <laughs> so I caught all those things right there. And so there's microbes in that. It's, it's uh, good for the soil, but it is also full of weed seeds. So don't just assume you can use this as bolts. It's going to be you know, perfect. Trap nutrients. So we need to really recognize that we are a source of fertility, right? If you do organic farming, you know about bone meal, you know about blood meal. Well, guess what? We have bones and blood. We also have manure. We have urea. Urine is an extremely potent form of, of it's, it's stronger than most chemical fertilizers. If you were to pee on a plant, it's going to kill you. It's, and with all this stuff, it's kind of like, you know, like, you don't want to talk about it, but you know what? You need to talk about it because that fertility that we have, that's, you know, in our cesspools and whatnot, it's a huge problem because we're not using it. So this is, I'm going to wrap it up after these couple slides. So this is um, a version of green natural farming. Farming, It's been called Kanaka natural farming by Mikala Min up on uh, Rum Maui. And we're just modifying with the natural farming system. So this is the Inikana, so the skin, you know, like the scraped skins of the, the, the column. Wait, no. So it's the skins and a little bit of the meat. After I peel the hollow, I put them in a steamed hollow basket. I want my basket to be clean, not some old dirty one. And I put about an inch or so in the bottom of the basket. I go into the bamboo forest, and, and you set this down on the forest. Uh, can't I see it here. One thing I found is if there's a lot of competition, like ironwood, you, you don't want to put it right on the ground because you don't have like the, the nice organic, you know, on the bamboo, like thick, thick like a tall bamboo, you get a buildup of nice duff. You want to put that on the duff, go collect the leaves, which are ideally going from green to white before they turn brown. There's a little phase where you see them, they're covered with microbes. Those microbes fall onto Kakalo or white rice is what they use, and that's a more sterile medium. We're touching this, but there's actually soil microbes that we have in common with ourselves. So it's it's a cool, like a whole different thing. Instead of a whole sterile system to start with, we're starting with our stuff and giving it to nature. So this is what it looks like after you're done and you do it right. And the microbes, they are the ones moving nutrients between trees. They're the internet, they move water, they move nutrients as needed from one plant to another. And this? Can I plug a class? Is this week on Thursday morning at my sanctuary? There are three classes every Thursday, but um, this week is on beneficial microorganisms. Oh, good. So, nice. And they make that. Oh, awesome. There you go, yeah, check it out. The yeah, they have lots of great classes on them. So this, this was a uh, column that we could call it that and, and uh, into the, the um, polo eye. So you get to Moku Moku, the island stage, polo eye, get it to a ball to go. And then I got home, I spread it out, and this one made the best stuff. 
And just like with Korean natural farming, I added brown sugar to it. Now, oh yeah, it's called chemo, by the way. Does anyone know what chemo means? Like the translation of chemo? Does it, does it mean to till? To lift? What's that? I'm not getting it. It's just like a classic Hawaiian guy. classic Hawaiian so it's Kalo IMO, so that's, that's what we came up with. So that's the, the Kalo IMO too. And check it out, this is what was on the inside. The original biogeochemists, the ones who do all the work, where they take the life, the life and the chemistry, and through it all, they're doing all kinds of magic. And this is what I'm talking about, like the, the, the huge potential we have now. They're just figuring out because of microbiology. We're finally able to get so small and just look at such a small thing and realize that these things have huge potential. They do so much for us every day and, and we've just been killing them off like there's no tomorrow. If we turn around and decide what can we do for you, then all of a sudden now we can turn it around into the system that's being really constructed into one that not only will grow, but it'll be like a forest where it's going to spread out. And I'm going to jump ahead. I didn't even cover the emu. I just got to get to my favorite picture. You protect your soil. Oh, yeah. We throw it in biochar. This is what happened after we threw the IMO2 in biochar. That's, that was black. Those are microbes. It was so exciting to see that. <laughs> um, and I don't know what these microbes are. So, you know, maybe there's a chance they're pathogenic microbes. I don't know. That's why we need to find out. That's the crotalaria. It grows on rock. I knew it right when I saw it the first time. I was like, you have got to come with me because it was growing on a rock road. And the soil I was at was so compacted. So if it can grow on rock, it can grow just about anywhere. What is, it? what is it? What is it? Oh, nitrogen fixing. Oh, okay. And so it's a it improves the soil, makes tons of organic matter, you can use it for mulch. Uh, when some of them, when they break down, they, they inhibit certain nematodes, which are like bugs that eat the roots. Is that the one they call woody pod mesh? Yeah, just yellow, flower. So yes, we can do, when we do our planting, so this is a really quick, the, the quick method you saw. First we got our microbes, right? We have our microbes. And then we have, yeah, I can do this quick now. After we get our microbes, we do biochar. We need a home for these microbes. This environment's so rainy, the microbes get washed away. Biochar has so much surface area, it'll, it'll increase your nutrient holding capacity if you add that to your soil. When you add more carbon, you can hold more nitrogen. So it's, just, it's like a bank where like you invest and then the bank invests some for you. It's, it keeps on compounding. But we can do bioenergy, which I know it's, you're probably grimacing. Somebody's like, bioenergy, that sounds crazy. Bioindustry, that sounds crazy. But, think about it like this. So nowadays, you know, people make emu. A traditional practice, at the end, you get biochar, plus uh, wood ashes, plus food. Whereas there's other people just making biochar where they're doing the single thing. They're in the matrix, they're doing it for one purpose, and they have tons of waste to get to the, what they need. They're not harvesting what they could. So, perhaps what we could do is make emu, but have some kind of a way of like building your freedom above it and make a biochar retort. It's a way to make biochar in a low oxygen environment. So we can double the biochar being made at a time when one emu is being made while that's burning, it's, it's making the, the biochar above it. The wood gas that's burnt off is useful for different things. Um, when you process it certain ways. So is wood vinegar. Um, and it's an energy source. 
And with that energy, we can create things. And with these microbes, we have all these enzymes. There's bioresin. We can be doing bio, like real bioplastics. It's a huge problem. But now they're starting to find out there's some bioplastics that are safe for turtles to eat. Or so they say. So we get our biochar made now. We can clear the soil, and hopefully it's not you know, some huge clearing. We protect the soil. We throw the, the, the IMOs down with this. We throw some earthworms in, in there for fun. Sow your cover crop right away. Here's what you're going to see. This is what I saw on a dirt road that I, I took the streets back, where I lived in a spot where there is an excavator road. And it was too wide. He wasn't using the whole thing, and the weeds were growing on the side, and they kept them running into my garden. So one day I was like, that's it. I'm gonna, I went in that, out there, pulled the weeds, and broke up the soil a little bit. And then after I planted, I threw the bamboo mulch down. And look at these microbes. It, it was off the charts. So if I could do that on a dirt road within a few months, you know, in an abused old dirt road, Think about the good thing that we have here. We can plant native, endemic, and cultural plants. The coco lao is an important medicine, but you know what? There's many cultures here. So yes, it's so important to plant the Hawaiian plants, the native plants, the endangered plants. But also, there's so many cultures. So halamangani, that thing is a superfood. That is such an important one. Another one that's going to be important for us more in the future. Here's what it looks like a little bit later. This is from the PPP Kalo garden. And, you know, Koko Lao, oh yeah, look at that. We had some Hawaiian Kalo varieties. I think that's Manapulu over there. Moringa. And then this one here is Cambrai hibiscus. It actually is a trap crop for one of the, the beetles. I'm not sure which one, either the Chinese or the Japanese beetle. I think it's a Chinese rose beetle. Chinese. So it's, instead of killing them all, it's smothering them, smothering them with love, where you're like, oh, you guys are hungry. I have something you're really going to like. And then they focus more on this plant than the other plants. Mm -hmm. It's also edible. Is that Roselle? Is that Roselle? Yes, yeah, Roselle. Yeah, was it? Hold on, Zach. Zach was here last time. It's Hibiscus acetosa is the species name. Okay. Yeah. Last time I asked him what it was, I had it up here on the screen. <laughs> okay, yeah, biofence. You can take cuttings of plants and stick them in the ground. Madre de cacao is one. You can have them really close together. It's called a palisade. Um, or they can be further apart and then woven together into a hedge. That's actually a sustainable system from Europe. Believe it or not, there's some pretty amazing ones from there, but hedges were the original barbed wire. Oh yeah, that was, it was also food. So windbreak, site adapted for all these things, but you know, this one has food and water. That's why coconuts are going to be very important. Our infrastructure is very um, delicate. And so if we don't have power, a lot of people don't have water. So coconuts, the best part is when those storms come in and they wreck everything, they're blowing the coconuts down to the ground. They're knocking over our perennial greens. So we should, after the storms, be walking out to harvest. Okay, yeah, vetiver. It's a grass, fast growing, non invasive. Plant it tight, plant it with perennial peanut. That'll fertilize it and it'll keep the weeds down. That's aba, so it's a row of uh, vetiver, then there's the, the, the aba behind that, and then a row of pigeon pea, which is an alley crop. All around the world, people have different methods of doing that vetiver system, but they just use other plants. The main thing is you've got to plant it really tight, and what they found is the erosion Sloping agricultural land technology loss only three tons, three and a half tons per year. The spot with none loss almost 200 tons. So that's where our conservation pays. 
So ice cream bean, it's a tree that's on the islands. Part of me is not sure about it because it, it can be a little bit weedy in the, the really wet spots. But in drier places, it's not so bad. It's an amazing tree. It's multifunctional. The leaves take forever to break down. So it's one of our better ones in terms of a tree that will pull the weeds down, the mulch. You can chop it really hard. And you can have it like this. Rows of this and rows of that. You plant in between. Come along here, chop, and throw it in there. And this is what a lot of the world is doing, where they don't have uh, herbicides and fertilizers. This is what is producing food. This is at the Kohala Center's demonstration farm. It's Perella Tina on the ground. And then Laricidia. We do no work here. And it stayed this way for a long time because of the shade and the ground cover. standard, so dwarf bananas, there's an ice cream there, ice cream bean, that's the standard, and then the new will be the standard later. And what that is, the standard is a tree that stands up straight, fills out here, and then the other one runs low. Okay, I'm going to skip to the very end, <laughs> and we, we, we have a special person here who's going to sing a song for us. All right. So, oh yeah, we, we were able to triple the Guinness World Record from that garden for the, the, the heaviest tarot. Um, that one was close, but yeah, the next one was, was bigger. Wow. No, yeah, huge. And here's what we found underneath the soil. Can you see that? See these things moving? The light in the land is protected by righteousness. It's a little sad to think that you have to do all this work to just replace what was already there. That's before. exactly what we have to do. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> but what we need to do is reforest, unharness the powers of nature. Instead of harness, we need to unleash them and let them do the work for us to reforest the land, get more food, and get the ocean back. Get Kanaloa back. Because life on the earth needs your help to survive. <coughs> so now you have a choice. I'm saying that we need to, everywhere was eating before. Everywhere was food or a system to work. It didn't work so well what they tried there. So now what I'm saying is, and other people are saying it, is replanting Eden. Starting here, and we need to replant the globe. That is where all that carbon needs to go. And when the earth was ravaged by, and the animals are dying, a new tribe of people shall come unto the earth, for many colors, classes, and creeds, and who by their actions and deeds shall make the earth green again. They will be known as the warriors of the rainbow. Which sounds a lot like Hawaii. So I said, go with your warriors. Thank you very much.
So, Kaholawe was being used as a bombing practice, and uh, Georgetown, Kibu Mitchell, Walter Reedy, uh, and some other five, there were five people there. And the song was written, Kimo Mitchell's father, Uncle Harry, wrote a song called Meleo Kaholawe. And when you look at a map and you look at the island of Kaholawe, it's in the shape of a fetus. And the song, Aloha Meleo Kaholawe, it depicts the story of an island like the, pe the people you know, of the world waiting to be, waiting for peace to come to them, the bombing. I, I saw Kaholawe being bombed once from Maui. And you can imagine what it, it was just like bombing, building everything, watching this whole destruction of the military. And George Helm, his last concert on Mokai, I was in charge of the concerts before he never returned from the island. He said, going to the island of Kaho'olawe was not the answer to stop the bombing of Kaho'olawe. It was looking in your own backyard. And, uh, and I just returned from six months on the mainland, on the west coast. And it doesn't matter where you are, aloha, aloha in your planet, carrying it. It's, uh, it doesn't have to do with just Hawaiian people. In fact, that was one of the problems when you try to confine the spirit of which is in all humanity. Uh, and so the song sings about bringing peace to the island, peace to humanity in the first verse. In the second verse, it talks about the need, although our numbers are few, at that time, now the numbers are great because of the language, the Renaissance in the language, the body is starting to find where the mind has gone in the language. So people, Hawaiian culture, people looking to the places where they once inhabited. Uh, in the political scenario, I would call it resettlement. Imagine uh, resettling the rivers of Maui is an example. The ones that don't have water in them and how much that would charge the uh, environment with oopu and all the nutrients to, to bring, you know, feed the ocean, get people off the streets. But the thing is not just restricted to Hawaiian people. So, And then the third verse, you know, you're recognizing the the people who have come to bring this awareness and actually people who give their lives and dedicate their lives to do this. And then it talks about all the people coming together to, to make a consciousness of Aloha Aina in the world. I'm looking forward to returning to uh, areas on the continental, uh, what they call America, and bringing halo, bringing kalo up there. Okay. Uh, this kalo is uh, just a magic food, and uh, I'll be looking forward to getting some. Uh, and I've had my hands on literally hundreds of varieties through the efforts of Dr. De La Pena, who is now no longer with the uh, experimental station up on Kauai, who had just returned. He had root groups by the hundreds, all the way to New Caledonia. And um, so it you know, moved out all my cars, planted the whole yard. You know? but, like you say, it's hard to keep track of the varieties that things get them. We could be here for a couple more hours, but because I had so many environmental songs.
is my roof and earth is my bed and the wind and the rain and the woods and the stones of my friend Quickly passes. You are the child of your dreams. How can you make it last? And it's a good earth. And this can be a good life. And this can be This can be the right time to find a little peace for your heart. And as I look into my heart, I found something waiting there. As water from the spring broad life to all things and as the birds and bees and dragonflies and twilight serenity and peace that I find burning Thank mm -hmm. you.